Hey guys, in this lesson, let's talk about k-means. K-means is a popular classroom algorithm, and there are quite some interview questions around this topic. Explain k-means clustering, how to choose k in k-means, pros and cons of k-means, implement k-means from scratch. As you can see, being able to answer these questions require you to have a good understanding of how k-means work. So in this lesson, we are going to go over the k-means algorithm step by step, how to choose k in k-means, and finally, we will summarize pros and cons of the k-means algorithm. Let's start with understanding the algorithm. k-means is a centroid-based cluster algorithm. As I mentioned earlier, it's very popular and used in a variety of applications such as market segmentation, document clustering, fraud detection, and image segmentation, etc. So there are four steps in the algorithm. The first step is that we randomly pick k-centroids from the training examples as initial cluster centers. These k-centroids should be chosen in a smart way because different positions lead to different results. A good choice is to place the initial centroids far away from each other instead of random initialization. After we have picked these k-centroids, we then assign each example to the nearest centroid. In k-means, we use Euclidean distance as the distance metric. We measure the distance between an example and the centroid using the Euclidean distance. Because of this, feature scaling is important for k-means. We want to make sure that the features are measured on the same scale, so we need to apply normalization or standardization if necessary. Next, we move the centroids to the center of the examples that were assigned to it. Basically, we compute the average for all the points inside each cluster, then we move the cluster centroid to the average. Finally, we repeat step 2 and 3 until some stopping criteria are met. It can be that the clustering reaches convergence, meaning that the cluster assignments do not change, or maximum number of iterations is reached. It can also be a user-defined tolerance is reached. For example, the variance do not improve by at least a certain amount. Here's an example of convergence of k-means. Initially, we choose three centroids, and the positions of them keep changing. Until the very last few iterations, the positions do not change that much. It means that it reaches convergence. Now let's look at the objective function of k-means algorithm. k-means algorithm chooses centroids that minimize the within cluster sum of squared errors, SSE, or cluster inertia. Here's the objective function of k-means algorithm. xi here means examples in cluster J. mu J is the centroid for cluster J. So our goal here is to minimize the sum of the square distance between xi and mu J. And the square distance is the within cluster sum of squared errors, SSE. Now let's move forward to the next section, how to choose k for k-means. There are two common use methods, elbow method and silhouette coefficient. Let's go over them one by one. The first method is elbow method. The intuition behind this technique is that the first few clusters will explain a lot of the variation in the data, but past a certain number of clusters, the amount of information added is diminishing. The k-means algorithm uses SSE to quantify the quality of clusters. If k increases, SSE will decrease, because k increases means we have more centroids, and the examples will be closer to the centroids they are assigned to. We can plot the elbow curve to identify the value of k where SSE begins to increase most rapidly. This is the point after which we don't see much decrement in SSE. Here's an example plot using the elbow method to find the optimal value of k. We have k on the x-axis, number of clusters, and on the y-axis is distortion, which is the same as SSE. Clearly, there is a sharp change in the y-axis when k equals 3. After this point, SSE decreases continuously, but we don't see much decrease in SSE. It means that choosing three centroids is probably a good option for this particular dataset. Another common use method to find the optimal k for k-means is the so-called silhouette coefficient. The silhouette coefficient measures how similar points are in its cluster compared to other clusters. This is how we define the silhouette coefficient. It's b minus a over maximum of a and b. 
A here means the average distance between example and all other points in the same cluster. B is the average distance between example and all other points in the next closest cluster. Basically, A quantifies the similarity of an example from other examples in the same cluster. And B quantifies the dissimilarity of an example and other examples in the next closest cluster. The silhouette coefficient varies between negative 1 and 1 for any given example. If the coefficient is 1, it means the example in the right cluster, because the dissimilarity between clusters is much larger than the similarity within clusters, which is what we want. If the coefficient is 0, it means cluster separation and cohesion are equal, which is not what we want. The worst scenario is when the coefficient is negative 1. It indicates the example is in a wrong cluster. Because the similarity is much larger than the dissimilarity, it means the similarity within clusters is much larger than the dissimilarity between clusters. So one example is more similar to other examples in other clusters than examples in its own cluster. By plotting the silhouette coefficient versus k, we can get an idea of the optimal value of k. Here's an example using k-means clustering with three centroids for a particular data set. And we can plot the silhouette coefficients when k equals 3. In this case, all three clusters have coefficients larger than 0.7. Now, if we choose two centroids instead of three for this particular data set, the clustering result is less than ideal because it seems that there should be two clusters here instead of one. We can plot the silhouette coefficients when k equals 2. And in this case, one cluster, I believe is cluster 2, has a coefficient less than 0.6. And the coefficient is much less than the coefficient of the other cluster. This indicates that k equals 2 is probably not a good option for this particular data set. Now we have covered two common methods to choose k for the k-means algorithm. Let's summarize the pros and cons of the k-means algorithm. K-means has some advantages over other clustering algorithms. It's easy to implement, it's computationally efficient, and speed is K-means' big win. K-means scales well to large numbers of samples and has been used across a large range of applications in many different fields, like I mentioned at the beginning of this lesson. There are also some downsides of K-means algorithm. First of all, the number of clusters K has to be determined. As we have seen in the previous example, an inappropriate choice of K can result in poor classroom performance. Another downside of K-means is its instability. The initial positions of centroids influence the final positions, so two rounds of K-means algorithm can result in two different clusters. Also, the shapes of clusters can only be circular. That's because the Euclidean distance doesn't prefer one direction over another, so it does not work well for datasets requiring flexible cluster shapes. Here's an example showing the result of k-means clustering on half-moon-shaped dataset. You can see that the k-means algorithm is not able to separate this half-moon-shaped dataset. Another downside of the k-means algorithm is that it's susceptible to curse of dimensionality. In very high-dimensional spaces, Euclidean distances tend to become inflated. So in this case, we should run a dimensionality reduction algorithm such as principal component analysis prior to k-means, which can alleviate this problem and speed up the computations.